All right, put your hands together for Bill. Man. Man. I ain't gonna take my jacket off because I'm like not, not buff like you. You told us you took it off just because you didn't, you know, you, you want to be like, you know, you took it off because you all styling and stuff. I ain't gonna take my jacket off. Where's my mirror? Bring me my mirror. My clock is going. Where's my clock? Look at that. I already lost 20 seconds. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, a round of applause for Chris Jackson. No, 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 no. You know what? You got to know something about me. You think he's hyped up. When I say a round of applause, I don't mean like, like you're a bunch of ladies. That's what that is. Like, like raise the roof for Chris Jackson right now. Come on. Yeah. Uh, by the way, dude, I'm going to kill you after this for putting me after Bill. Can I just say that? <laughs> like experience, education, looks. Chris has made me a better man. I looked up that word better last night, a couple different dictionaries. To grow more desirable, to have increased satisfaction. Turn the person next to you and say, satisfaction. Uh, to experience greater effectiveness. This is this word better. And uh, Chris has made me a better man. He's made me a better man. And today we're talking about just getting better. And I'm going to be very, very specific. I'm going to ask you to take some notes. Um, and we're going to walk through a little bit about money. Now, uh, I want to start with this mirror because... Money, I want you to think about money like a mirror. Turn the person next to you and say, you ugly. <laughs> Man, I didn't tell you to say anything more than that. <laughs> now, what's the purpose of a mirror? Right? I mean, the purpose of a mirror is... Stand in front of it and to make sure if you have hair, sorry, Bill, <laughs> you know, that it's somewhat straight and, you know, things are looking good and that's the purpose of a mirror. I want you to think about money as a mirror. Money is a mirror. Money is powerful, not in and of itself, but money is powerful because it reveals something about what's inside of you. That's why we get all anxious and nervous about talking about money. Because at the end of the day, money is going to reveal something about you. And in fact, it's going to magnify. We have a big mirror in our uh, bathroom and on that big mirror is another little mirror that is uh, a, a magnifying kind of mirror, you know? Uh, and, and you get up nice and close in that bad boy and just pick a zit right there. It's, come, it's something like, that's what money does. Money it reveals something about you and, in fact, magnifies something that's inside of you. For instance, if you give a load of cash to an angry person, that cash will magnify the anger in its expression. Come on now. You give a bully a lot of money, they're going to be a bigger bully. You give a manic depressive a lot of money, they're going to go what? Drink. <laughs> That's what they're going to do. And, and the, the, that money, it allows them, right, to act out what's inside. Money doesn't make you anything, by the way. Money simply reveals what's inside. That's why money is a spiritual issue. Now, I know we, don't, we ain't doing church today. Somebody say Amen. But even if you're not a follower of Christ in this room, you will have to admit that money is a spiritual issue. 
Money reveals something about how you think, how you dream, what aspirations you have, the attitudes and perspectives that you take in life. Money reflects those and it magnifies those. This is very much a spiritual issue. So I'm gonna talk about some very specific steps about how to be a better man when it comes to your money, but allow me just for a moment to pause and say, the only way you can be the best man is to connect with your creator. Before you get to DEF, you gotta go ABC, you gotta admit, believe, and choose Jesus. So I want you to just kind of think about that a little bit and, and close with a story related to, re related to that issue but it's very much a spiritual issue money is. It reveals who you are and it magnifies what you do. This is why Jesus said, by the way, where your treasure is, there your what? Your heart will be also. So money is a mirror. Number two, write this down. Money is a tool. Money is a tool to assist you in becoming a better man. Money is a tool to assist you in becoming a better man, to assist you in fulfilling the calling and purpose of God on your life. It's a tool. It's a tool. My father's a contractor, and so I grew up, actually grew up overseas in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, where is my African brother from, by the way? What continent are you from? What c country are you from? Uganda. Habari bwana He doesn't know Swahili, apparently. Okay. <laughs> ah, uh-huh. Uh, my dad's a, a contractor, and so I grew up in a contractor's home, which means I got very familiar with different tools, right? And I would spend my days off of school following him around and, and uh, you know, it was a big day when I got my own tool belt. And I strapped that bad boy on and, and, and got my tools together and, and my father kind of taught me there are certain tools that you use for certain things and other tools that you use for other things. So I just want you to think with me for a few minutes about money as a tool. I'm gonna give you maybe three, we'll see how much time I have, maybe four really specific ways to use this tool, okay? Number one, get out of debt. We tried to get Dave Ramsey here this morning, but he was a little busy, so. I'm a, I'm a Ramsey fan in general. I got some issues with some of the things that uh, he says and teaches, but in general, I would say to you, if you walk away from this little 30 minutes with me, and this is the only thing that somehow I can convince you to do, then we would have, we would have spent a good day today together and you will be a better man financially. Get out of debt. Get out of debt. People will tell you that debt is a tool to get ahead. It is not. Debt is a product of you spending money you don't have on things you don't need to impress people who don't really care about you. <laughs> Debt is not a tool. Say this aloud. Debt is not a tool. Everybody else outside of this room is going to tell you, and some people in this room are going to tell you, oh, no, 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 debt's a tool. Debt's a tool, John. You got to use debt to get ahead. You got to use debt to just stay even. You got to use debt to be competitive. No, you don't. Debt is not a tool. It is a product, a byproduct, a result of you spending money you currently do not have. That's what debt is. Get out of debt. You say, oh, John, don't you have a mortgage? Yes, I have a mortgage. And I'm working to get that mortgage eliminated. 98% 98%, get this, get this, 98% um, of our national debt, revolving debt, is pretty much on credit cards. $850 billion worth. When we took our entire church through, we did some surveys about how much revolving debt, credit card debt, was in the average family at Grace Church. 
You know what we discovered? $16,000 was the average. Don't be whistling at me. (laughs) Get out of debt. People are going to say to you, it's okay if it's 0% interest. It's okay. It's zero. Go buy a car. It's 0% interest. It's not okay. Because you're borrowing money, you're committing to make a payment on something that tomorrow you don't know if you're going to have your job or not. You are presuming on the future. The wisest man who ever walked on this earth outside of Jesus Christ said, do not presume that tomorrow is actually going to come. So even a 0% Debt loan is not smart because you are presuming on something that you actually do not know will be there. Others will tell you, it's okay to go in debt. You deserve it. Oh, you work so hard. You sacrifice so much. It's been a long time since you've gone on a vacation. You need that car. You need that that extra boat, everybody else is doing it, it's fine. Basically what they're saying is, listen to your inner voice of immediate gratification. Get out of debt. Get out of debt. When we started the campaign at Grace Church, um, it was... I think the second or third year that I had taken over the lead pastor post and I'd been, I'd been around church my whole life and been at Grace for already 10 years, 11 years when um, the Lord moved me into that senior position post and, and I'd been around long enough to know that when you, as a senior pastor, preach about money, your attendance goes down. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> and... Um, I had such a deep conviction, and our leadership team had such a deep conviction about this, that when I came and presented to our our elders and our our senior leadership team, I wasn't just going to preach two sermons, I was going to preach ten. They looked at me and like, really? But but it comes from this, this deep, deep place of conviction that money reveals something about what's inside of us. And the scriptures over and over talk about debt being akin to slavery. You might say, well, John, it's it's too big, like I'm too buried. No, you're not. Don't listen to that stupidity. You're not. Yeah, you, you, you might be buried deep, but you're never too deep. Just tackle it. For a church our size, we had about a 1.8, 1.9 million dollar uh, low and actually in, in, in the grand scheme of things that's not a lot not, not, not a lot for a, a, a church our size but it still seemed like a lot to me like how, how are we going to do that and by just praying together and thinking together we, we said you know what wouldn't it be great if everybody at Grace Church participated in this, in this uh, campaign of ours so we came up with this little repurposed slogan 500 people repurposing $20 a week for 33 months that would get us 1.3. In the meantime, we would be paying our normal mortgage payments, and that would be 1.8, and we'd be debt-free in three years. We never did get 500. We got 300. But in less than 33 months, we paid off $1.8 million. So don't, don't, don't tell me it's too big. When my wife and I got a hold of this and God got a hold of this concept in our own lives, uh, we, had, we had already made some decisions that had put us in debt, and t- primarily in terms of our cars and vehicles. And, and uh, I came home one day, and, and my wife and I sat down, and we said, you know what, um, we, can't, we can't go back on this necessarily. We need this particular car. And I said, well, listen, then here's what we're going to do. And my kids got down in the basement, and we put a picture of our flex up on the wall and had a fender, and it had a top, and it had some tires, and, and uh, we just went to town every spare penny we could have, every spare dollar we had, we would just go down. And every time we would pay off a chunk of it, we'd like rip a fender off the the flex on the the picture until there was nothing left on the wall. (laughs) I own my car now. My car doesn't own me. 
So don't, don't tell me it's too big, it's too hard, it's wah, wah, wah. Like, listen to that inner voice, right? It was military, right? As we say, the reason they're stronger than the rest of us is because they actually have a stronger internal gauge in them that says, I'm not going to follow my feelings. I'm going to actually do something that everybody else is not doing because I want to get out of this predicament that I'm in. Get out of debt. Sell something. Sell a car. Oh, yeah, I can't sell my car. It's, it's such a good deal when I got it. Where, 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 where? Sell it. Take the bus. Carpool. Buy a bike. There's stuff in your garage you haven't looked at for three years. Sell it. Sell a kid. No, don't do that. <laughs> We were so serious about this at Grace Church that we sold our bus. We had this massive bus, and we loved the bus, but it was expensive. And finally, our leadership just said, why, why are we doing this? Why are we spending all this money? So we sold the bus. We had this massive all-church garage sale, and so we let everybody come on our campus, and they set up all these booths, and everybody, you know, sold all their crap to everybody else. <laughs> I, like, get, get intense. Get intense about this. Get, get out of debt. Okay, num number two. Um, number two, get on a budget and work the plan. Get on a budget. I know this may really sound like really rudimentary and not super profound, and, and I apologize for my simplicity. But get on a budget. Every dollar on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. Every dollar on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. Every dollar on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. Say that loud with me. Every dollar on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. Allocate your resources instead of paying for your desires. And this doesn't, it doesn't matter how much money you make or how little money you make. It's nothing to do with your socioeconomics and where you're at. In, in your current financial situation. Some of you are so buried and so out of control and so in debt, you're just barely, like, you're stressed out sitting here. Others of you maybe are on the other side of that spectrum. You've made some decisions along the way, and if I could bring you up here and give you my time, you would tell some stories about how you failed and how, you know, you made this mistake, but, but you've been faithful, and over time, you've now kind of disciplined yourself with some of these habits. This doesn't make any difference how much money you make. It makes every difference about being disciplined about having every dollar on paper on purpose before the month begins. Because if you don't do that, your money will start to tell you what to do. That's what will happen. Three maybe little things you can kind of jot this down, kind of in the margin of get on a budget. Uh, I don't have time to go into this. Uh, I could do it scripturally, theologically, but I don't even need to do that. There are some general principles with regards to money that I think are all over scripture and they're just common sense. Number one, gain it. Number two, give it. Number three, grow it. Some of you have an income problem, a job problem, and, and you need to kind of rethink that. Gain it, give it, and grow it. For those of you who are familiar with the biblical text of Matthew 25, uh, I, I truly believe that when God gives you something, he expects you to grow it. I think that's what Matthew 25 is about, by the way. I think he expects you, every one of us, when he gives you something for you, to, for you to grow and multiply it. Not before you give it and not before you gain it and work for it, but even so. Every dollar on purpose, on paper, before the month begins. Get on a budget. I remember when my wife and I first sort of kind of started on this journey together. Uh, I'm a free spirit kind of guy. I, I, um, that's sort of the way I my gifts, my gift mix, my personality. My wife is the exact opposite of me. She's more of a planner. You know, a concept of a budget is really cool for her. I hate budgets. I don't want to be told what to do with my money. I just want to do it. Come on now. And I had looked at budgets as a negative sort of straight jacket. And, and it took me a while to kind of just kind of loosen up and say, actually, John, a budget is a freedom tool. It's a freedom tool. It's a way for you to allocate at the beginning of the month how you want to live your life. And if you were to look at my budget and put it up, it would reveal something about me and about my wife and about our priorities. Money 
Gentlemen is a tool that God gives you to accomplish the purpose and calling of your life. Now, if you're unclear about your purpose and you're unclear about your calling, well, then you're going to forever be frustrated with money management. And part of the beauty about disciplining yourself to get on a budget is it allows you to think critically about how God has gifted you, what God has called you to do, and how he's calling you to do it. And to say, okay, I am going to allocate my resources in ways that cause me to be a better husband, in ways that cause me, that enable me and assist me to be a better leader, in ways that assist me to be a better uh, manager of my health and my relationships. Get on a budget and work the plan. Number three, get a mentor. Get a mentor. You won't get better by thinking about getting better. You're not going to get better by simply coming to this conference. You're not going to get better uh, simply by standing at a distance and watching someone else and then trying to mimic them and how they manage their money. I've tried it, it doesn't work. My two biggest failures financially were because I stood at a distance and watched somebody else do something and I thought to myself, oh, that's a dandy idea, let me do it. Copy, paste, failure. You're not going to get better at this because you, um, you, you, you're going to get better at this because you pursued someone who is smarter than you, wiser than you, and has demonstrated competency in this area. Allow me to just speak for just a moment about, about who you should look for to mentor you. I know we're going to talk about mentoring later today, so I don't want to necessarily get into that. So I'll keep it very specific to this particular topic of finances. Uh, um, it, it's, it's very important. Like, uh, just a, maybe a warning to start this little conversation. Don't select someone simply because you like them. And they have this great idea to purchase this land in Wyoming. Ask yourself a couple questions about this person that you want to have mentor you. What, what do they have to gain financially by mentoring you? That might be the best question to, to ask up front. Again, I don't want to get into mentoring in general, but just with regards to financial stewardship and being a better man, being a better financial manager of the resources for which God has entrusted to you. What does that person have to gain by coming alongside of you and helping you to think about your financial future? I speak, my friends, as one who has been there and made mistakes. You will make mistakes. Please don't make the same ones that I did. Be careful to pursue other people who have your best interest in mind and not their financial gain. Have they demonstrated competency in this area? You know what the word competency means, right? The word competency means demonstrated excellence. Can they demonstrate to you that they have led financially in an excellent way? Not have they talked about it, not have they presented on it, not have they read about it, but have they actually demonstrated a competency with regards to managing money? I've been amazingly blessed by God in so many areas, uh, financially and mentally and spiritually and all these areas. so fun for me to be here today to kind of fill up my tank in these um, different uh, areas of our, of our development. And God has been so gracious to me to bring people around me who have 
demonstrated competencies in these area, areas of my life. And I, I would just plead with you, I would plead with you, do not try and do this on your own. Have the humility to say, I've not done this. In fact, I've made some mistakes and I need some help and wisdom. I have several people in my life that um, both professionally and personally uh, have walked with me through uh, many of the mistakes and the, the mild successes that God has allowed me to experience. One of them in the area of finances, and I have several, um, has been just a great mentor to me. And the reason that I will oftentimes call him and say, you know, can we go to lunch together and just kind of sit down and, and kind of catch up, and he'll, he'll, he's always so gracious with his time, and we'll meet at a restaurant somewhere where nobody knows either one of us so we don't get interrupted, and, and I'll begin to just share with him. And, and you know what's so remarkable about that friendship is that um, as as God has been gracious and kind to Carolee and I, and we've um, practiced some of these principles over the last decade or, or more, and experienced some of the milestones of the long, disciplined financial stewardship, is that from the very beginning of my relationship with him, from the very uh, first little milestone that Carolee and I got over, he was so excited. He's just so excited. You know why he was so excited? Because he remembers the first time that he got to that milestone. And then we got to the next milestone, and, and, and he's like, wow, you did it. And then we got to the third milestone and the fourth milestone and the fifth milestone. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I met with him, and I said, um, through some Sometimes God forces you into decisions that you would have never taken on your own, but God knows better than you do. Somebody say amen. amen. And I looked at him and I said, it, it, it appears that I'm marching toward our next milestone. And he's like, what? So soon? And I'm like, yeah. And we talked and we prayed and we laid out all the data again and... and um, and God spoke to me through him that day. Because I, after almost a decade of practicing these kinds of principles, still had a sense of, kind of, I have to control this. And God was slowly but surely just sort of taking my hands off of it. I'm pleading with you men. There's somebody in close proximity to you that God can use in your life. But you gotta go find him and you gotta go pursue him and you gotta ask him. Get a mentor, get a mentor. Get out of debt, get on a budget, get a mentor. I got a minute 40 left, God be praised. <laughs> Uh, uh, which one do I want to do? I got a couple more. I'm just going to do this one. Um, show me the money. <laughs> How many of you have watched this movie? It's an old movie, right? Jerry Maguire. And you know that, that scene there where he's losing all of his, he's losing all of his, uh, his clients and, and uh, he's got his, his one athlete on the phone and, and uh, the whole office is watching and, and he's in the office. You remember this scene? And, and his athlete... Uh, you know, he's working him, he's working him, and he gets to the end, he's, show me the money! And he finally gets there, and goes, show me the money! This is such a great scene, isn't it? When, 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 uh, when opportunities come up in our house to purchase things and things like that, oh my goodness, show me the money! And we dance it around the kitchen! Hey, listen, can I just say to you, as difficult as it might be for you to cut up that credit card this afternoon and go to a full cash system for 60, 90, 120 days, one of the best things that Carolyn and I did is we said, you know what, 
we, we're going to get rid of any and all immediate gratification. We're going to budget this stuff out. And when God gives us an opportunity, we're going to exercise discipline to bless other people. And we're going to trust that he will always take care of us. God is never, never, ever going to not take care of you. I'm, I didn't ask Chris for permission to do this, but I'm going to ask you just for a moment, would you just close your eyes and bow your heads? I just want to pray for you. God, there's something so valuable and precious to us about money. We work hard for it. It um, it's so much a part of the fabric of our beings and our life. And we're so very aware, God, that it, it reveals what's inside of us. Forgive us for um, those habits that we've gotten into that have not reflected your priorities and, your, and the freedom that comes in you.